Building a new factory can be a daunting prospect, but planning it out doesn't have to be, especially when you have the know-how to leverage a competent program like the Satisfactory Modeler to do your work for you. I'm Jeezy, and by the time we're done here, you'll know how to more effectively use every tool on this list, conveniently track your inputs and outputs with the Metrics tab, identify and pick between different plan types to best suit your needs, and understand the benefits and use cases of the alternate calculator modes. This is a companion video to the one that I did about the basics of Modeler a little while ago, so if you missed that one, you should probably check it out first. I'm going to start off with a strange little building called a splurger. Dragging multiple inputs and one output will allow it to function as a merger, doing the opposite will allow it to function as a splitter, but you can drag multiple inputs and multiple outputs to have it simulate both. This of course does not map accurately onto anything in game as there's no structure which provides both of these functions. So this is really more of a way to compact what you're looking at, or combine many resource lines into one for easy visualization. A priority merger will prefer to use its top input while only using the bottom input if there are insufficient resources otherwise. This is great for injecting overflow from another factory and gives you control over whether you're using on-site resources or imported resources first. This structure doesn't exist in the 1.0 version of the game, even though you can build one with some advanced know-how. However, they do exist on 1.1 Experimental and will be coming soon TM. So in the meantime, it may be good to familiarize yourself with their potential uses. The Priority Splitter, however, works just like a Smart Splitter would in-game. It prefers to split its inputs out of its green top output first, while only sending anything to the bottom output if there's overflow. At a very basic level, you can use these things to send overflow out of a factory and into another outpost, send them to storage containers, dimensional depots, or sinks. Another more advanced use of a priority splitter is when you have one input and want to make two different recipes from it, prioritizing one over the other. I'm currently reworking my steel factory and want to supplement some of my steel beam production with concrete using the molded steel beam recipe, but I don't have enough concrete to supplement all of my steel. Therefore, I've set up a priority splitter to first send my steel over to the foundries running the molded beam recipe sending whatever's left to the regular beam constructors to make sure I'm using all of my available concrete before switching back to the regular recipe. Let's move over to the Metrics tab, accessed by this little book in the bottom left corner. The topmost dropdown is for selecting what you're viewing the metrics of. You can view everything you've ever made in Modeler, you can select your current outpost, or you can right-click and drag over a number of machines and change it to Selection View. There are a few other options, but those are the ones which I find the most helpful. The drop-down menus below that are for selecting specific metrics. We're going to start off with viewing the output metric. This is a great way to keep track of where your resources are ending up. The unused output will show you any resources which are currently sitting in the output of a machine waiting to be moved down a production line. These are also highlighted in green, so they're pretty hard to miss. The used output will show you anything moving out of your current selection. When using the selected view to highlight multiple outposts, this will show you what resources are moving into and being consumed within them. Toggling the sink output will show you how many items are moving to a sink. If you want to see sink points specifically, you'll have to create another metric window, this time for output sink points. It has all of the same settings as the output tab, but instead of showing you the number of items, we'll show you their value in points. This includes their potential value if you were to sync them instead of storing them. The storage container output will show you anything you have moving into a storage container. This is where I would recommend keeping any overflow from factories that you intend to use at a later date, but don't have a current use for, as it's nice to see everything at a glance in one place. You can also view how many items you have flowing into dimensional depots. Do keep in mind your current tech level, to make sure you can actually sustain that upload speed. Cross-referencing the dimensional depot and output sync points metrics can help you decide if you have too many items flowing into one and whether they would be more valuable getting turned into points instead. The next one I want to talk about is the input metric. The unmade input will show you any machines currently awaiting resources that are unable to begin construction without them. These are highlighted in red. 
The made input is similar to the used output, except now it will show you items which are made outside of your current selection and being moved in. A resource produced in another outpost, for example. The extractor input is probably the most useful thing in here, as it will give you a sum of all of the raw resources being produced in your current selection, so there's no need to tally them up yourself. Let's talk about storage containers. This may seem mundane, but there's some really cool stuff that you can do with these settings. Containers will start off in partially full mode. This allows calculations in multiple factory areas to exist independently. For example, setting this bank of constructors to a machine limit of 999, producing almost 20,000 iron plates, would require almost 30,000 ingots. And we can see that with the ingots we have supplied, we have a deficit of 29,850. If we however begin attaching more iron ingots to that container, we can see the deficit decrease. Now we definitely have some work to do before we're producing 20,000 plates, but in the meantime that container is acting as an infinite source of ingots. This lets us edit the calculations on the right hand side of the container without affecting anything to the left. The container's value will continue updating dynamically, letting us know how much more supply we need. This also works in reverse, giving you an idea of how much excess you're producing allowing you to scale back production to reach 100% efficiency. There's another reason why you would want to start tossing these things into your plans, but more on that in a later section. There are also a couple of other container modes. Empty mode will not allow the deficit view, being more true to life if you were failing to supply an intermediary buffer with enough resources to keep subsequent machinery running, and full mode, which will not allow the excess view. If a container in this mode is receiving more inputs than outputs, supply will be reduced to match demand. Empty and full are not nearly as useful as partially full, however they can be used to diagnose where inefficiencies lie in your factories, as well as identifying bottlenecks. Next up, I had some people request that I show them how to use this program for load balancing. And I'm sorry to say that after spending about an hour trying to get this 1 to 10 setup working, it lacks the functionality of sending the same resources along the same path multiple times. As you can see in the top left corner, the iron ore icons are here, but it lacks values. You can however double click on any of these splitters, and add a title to help keep track of where your items are being sent back, and just use it for general layout planning. And while it won't be making your load balancers for you or telling you how they work, it can spit you out some ratios so that you know what kind of load balancer you need. While I was trying to get load balancing working, I figured I would test how the program handles manifolding, as viewing a factory in an exploded view that's more true to life can help you visualize the actual layout. In this case I have 300 ore being run along 10 splurgers, split off into the next, and also out into their own respective smelter. One benefit of this layout method is it will show you how much of a resource you have moving to the next part of the manifold. This does presume line saturation and will unfortunately not reflect the way that earlier machines in a manifold fill up much quicker than those later down the line. And then I have a priority splitter at the end set to move any overflow into this container. And this actually calculated pretty well. However, copying and pasting the manifold onto the other side to ferry the iron ingots away stopped the calculations altogether. I came back after about 10 minutes and found it still calculating. And this is a pretty simple loop, just moving iron through smelters. So while this can be a good way to visualize a section of a production line that you're unfamiliar with, I wouldn't recommend doing this en masse or in a larger plan. Instead, I want to show off how to convert something like this into something like this as they represent exactly the same thing, but one is a lot less calculation intensive. In this case it's super easy because we can just delete the last 9 smelters and splitters and increase the machine limit on our remaining card to 10. And just like that we've converted something which is going to take a lot of processing power and space into something much more compact. Having your machines separated in banks also helps with increasing or decreasing machine limit or changing overclock, as you'll only need to do it once. 
A too detailed plan is likely to break your calculations, but it's also possible to make your plan too small. One line representing too much resource flow is unhelpful. So this is where I'd like to introduce you to what is quickly becoming my go-to planning method for larger factories. A nice sweet spot between detailed and compact. There are a few primary benefits to these hybrid plans. First, they're a lot easier to translate into the game. 48 refineries can be daunting, but 6 banks of 8 refineries are a lot easier to find space for. Someone left a comment under the last video saying they were unable to figure out how to change the belt speed. And that makes sense, because these lines are not actually belts, and therefore don't adhere to any throughput limits. The reason I'm bringing this up is because it gets a lot easier to treat them as if they were belts by breaking your factories up in this way. Moving from right to left, these banks of 8 refineries are each producing 480 iron ingots, which is exactly the maximum throughput of a Mark IV belt, while the ore moving into the refineries can easily be accommodated by a Mark III with a maximum throughput of 270, and the 600 ore leaving the extractors and moving into the containers can be accommodated by a Mark V with a max throughput of 720. And that same principle can be applied to the pipes as the water requirement for a single bank is well under the throughput of a Mark I pipe. So each of these banks can be supplied by a single belt and a single pipe. You can change the calculator mode by coming to the top right, clicking these three lines, going to Settings, General, and clicking this drop down here. The full calculator mode will do all of the work for you from the beginning to the end of a production chain, and making a single change anywhere will cause the entire thing to recalculate. This is useful for a production chain that you're unfamiliar with, and it works totally fine if you're doing small or disconnected factories where a single change won't affect too much at once. However, it is the slowest method and can take a lot of time to recalculate even a single value change in a much larger plan. One way to continue using the full calculation mode even after your factories get a bit larger is to segment them with partially full containers. This allows you to cut the calculations up into chunks, making sure they don't all happen at once. Do keep in mind that using your containers in this way will require you to set machine and part limits later down your production line, as a partially full container acting as an infinite source of its output will stop acting as a natural bottleneck. For example, my concrete production here is massively in the red, as my steel factory is attempting to use way more than I could ever realistically produce. Because the only other input is steel, it will just use all of the available steel while disregarding concrete as a bottleneck. But by setting a machine or part limit on these foundries, we can get that concrete down to a more reasonable value. Next up we have the manual calculation mode. This mode allows conflicting values to exist, and some will be arbitrarily ignored. Anything which contains a conflicting value will be highlighted in red for you to fix. Entire outposts will be highlighted if there's even a single machine bank in there with a conflicting calculation. I personally find this mode to be a lot less intuitive. It also stops priority splitters and priority mergers from working. However, fewer automatic calculations means that even very large plans load incredibly fast. Whether you decide to go with full or manual mode, I would recommend picking one and sticking to it, as swapping between modes will change your entire modeler. You can't do one outpost in one and another outpost in another and it's really difficult to convert between them if you've been using one for a long time. Finally, we have the no calculation mode. I've yet to find a ton of practical use for this mode, but you can use it to plan factory layouts that you don't need or already have the calculations for. Thanks for watching everybody. If you enjoyed or learned something, please leave a like, subscribe if you'd like to see more, and comment down below telling me what you thought. One final thing I wanted to address is a question that I've received a lot. People have been asking if I will release my world save. Currently, the answer to that question is no, as I have some factory tour videos planned and I would like those to catch up or at least be pretty close to my current progress before I begin sharing the full save. However, every video that I've released a factory tour for, I will begin including a link to my Patreon down in the description below where you can get access to the mega print of that factory and import it into your own world in case you want to take a look. 
The end goal of this is to eventually catch the factory tours up to my current progress and begin releasing the entirety of the world save in stages. As I complete a new factory, the world save will be updated. I'm also going to be releasing some additions to my current blueprints over there, such as this glass train tunnel which is designed to snap on top of my modular rail blueprints. To be perfectly clear, most of the things that are going up over there are going to require the $5 a month subscription tier to view and access. I will also be moving all of my existing blueprints over there so you can find them all in one place, but those will remain free if they already are. Even if there's nothing over there which strikes you as worthwhile at the moment, you can come and join as a free member to be notified of any new posts. So come check it out. It's a great way to support the channel and get something cool in return. And thank you so much to my two first Patreon supporters, Adam G and BJS. You guys are awesome. I appreciate any support that y'all have for me. I love what I do, but I couldn't do it without you.